did some years ago having to do with uh, the most creative people in the 20th century. And uh, that book eventually, uh, well, was, was published, and that was called The Price of Greatness. I dealt with 18 different professions in that book. Politics was one of them, but there were many other professions, science, uh, art, uh, musical composition, dance, and so forth. And uh, even though I looked at a very large number of people in that study, one of the professions that puzzled me the most was politics, because there were a number of great leaders there. And um, after I completed that project, I got wondering more and more, what is political greatness? In almost all the other professions, there's something tangible you can go on. Uh, a scientist does research, he publishes his work, an artist performs, an athlete uh, performs, uh, a businessman makes money, products, and so forth. What is it that a politician actually does? And, uh, you know, they, they well, what is the product, the work product? And in many instances, some people will uh, say this political uh, leader is great, and in other instances, they'll say he's terrible. So how do you measure political achievement? What is political greatness? That's how I started the study. And uh, what I did was to look at all of the world leaders in the 20th century, of every single country in the world. 1,941? Right, good for you, yes. And 199 countries. 1,941 leaders in the 20th century. That's correct. You looked at all of them. I looked at all of them, and I collected information on all of them. But what I did was to home in on a subgroup of them as well, 377, about whom there was much more information available about their personal lives, about uh, their achievements, about uh, um, how they gained power, how they lost power, about their families, that type of thing. And from that information, the book evolved. Where did you do it from? What, what, where, where are you located? Uh, the University of Kentucky Medical Center in Lexington, Kentucky. And how long have you been there? Oh my goodness, I can't count that high. I've been there uh, since 1970. And psychiatry, is that, uh, are you a doctor of psychiatry? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm a physician. Uh, I'm, I'm a doctor, doc, professor of psychiatry. Why that field for you? When did you get interested in that? Oh my goodness. Uh, I, I don't know. I started off medical school thinking about surgery and thinking about uh, general practice. And somewhere along the way, maybe in my third year of medical school. Where'd you go, by the way? Uh, the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I sat in on a lecture, uh, one of my first psychiatry lectures, and it's like falling in love. You just see somebody and something clicks and uh, I just knew the field was for me. So that's, that's how I ended up in psychiatry. What about the cover of this book? Ah. What's, this, what's this saying? <laughs> well, it, uh, it says that there is a relationship between political leaders and uh, other primates. And uh, uh, this is a particularly uh, whimsical uh, portrait. It's done by Donald Roller Wilson. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it, it, it says, I believe, a lot of some of the conclusions that I came to in the book. Give us a couple. Well, uh, be, before I give them to you, I, I, I really need to uh, explain how I came to these conclusions. Uh, when I first started this study, I had no idea at all that I would be making a comparison between political leaders and other types of primates, chimpanzees, baboons, monkeys, so forth. Um, but as I got 
into my work more and more, a number of questions began emerging that I could not answer. Um, I, uh, that puzzled me. For example, why was it that there were so few women rulers in the 20th century? How many have there been? Uh, there were a total of 27 out of 1941, which the percentage was 1.4 percent. And of those, half of them, at least half, were either wives of some famous politician. They borrowed their husband's charisma or daughters of him. And uh, so that left, if you look at just women who have made it on their own, that was about three quarters of one percent. So the chances of a woman becoming a ruler in the 20th century were less than the 100 to one odds, over 100 to one odds against it. That puzzled me. And the reason it puzzled me was um, there are very <laughs> many very brilliant, uh, competent women. And surely, uh, many, many more should have been able to have maneuvered themselves into positions of power, despite a lot of social constraints and cultural constraints and that type of thing. So that was one thing. Another thing that uh, puzzled me as I looked at many of the world leaders, and I, this was a surprising finding, was uh, that one could become a leader, the most powerful position in the country, not being very bright. Many of them were illiterate. Many of them were frankly crazy. And even a number of them were demented. And by that I mean brain damaged. So here is the most powerful position in the world, in a way, a most powerful position in a nation. How can people get there and why? Another uh, interesting finding I came across had to do with how many political leaders prior to coming to power had demonstrated their physical prowess as a way of gaining power. They were involved in wars, coups, uh, rebellions. Uh, along the way, they were jailed for demonstrations, things along these lines. So. Part of the process of becoming a ruler for many, many countries had to do with uh, demonstrating some type of physical prowess, some type of courage, some type of heroic behavior. Why? Why would that be necessary rather than wisdom, uh, accomplishments in, in uh, certain areas, business, the arts? Why? Did having military accomplishment, why was that so important? Another puzzling finding uh, had to do with, uh, uh, as I looked at many of the rulers, I, I was <laughs> struck in many countries with how many women they consorted with. Uh, for example, how many wives they had. Uh, compared to others. How many children they produced? Who had the most wives? Oh my goodness. Uh, well, let, let me tell you uh, this, that uh, uh, the, the uh, Ashanti, uh, because they did not want to distract their leader too much, put a limit, imposed a limit, that the king could only have 3,333 wives. Now that was supposed to with just that, I mean, my goodness, sometimes with one wife or two wives, that is enough to distract most people. But when you put a limit of 3,300 on somebody, that, that says something. Um, another uh, king, uh, it was King Matessa, I believe, had s supposedly 7,000 wives. Um, but on, on the, the, the ones that most people have heard of. The ones that most heard of? Yeah. Well, during the 20th century, well, let me, let me think. Um, the, the, well, of, of, during the 20th century, uh, there's King Sabuzo of Swaziland in the 20th century, I believe had 
wives in the 60s, 70s, something of that nature. I know that he had over 500 children. How did you go about your research on this, and how long did it take you? Uh, I, well, I guess simply put, uh, I looked at every possible source I could. I uh, looked at every bit of biographical information. Uh, I looked at, uh, oh, I think along the way, I read over 1,200 biographies. Uh, over looked, what time? Over, over about an 18-year span. So this study was done over about 18 years. And the University of Kentucky published this? The University Press of Kentucky. Yeah, that's what yes. I mean. Uh, and w w was that an agreement you had with them for years, or did you have to complete the study before they would I, do it? I had it completed before they did it, yes. I, I did not have any commitment for publication prior to having completed the, the study in the book. And what was your goal? What do, what do you want people to do with this? Uh, I believe that this is the most comprehensive, complete study on human rulers that have ever, that's ever been done. Uh, it has more information about political leaders than any other book I've encountered. And uh, my hope with it all is, aside from the thesis that I developed to explain a lot of their behavior, that in my last chapter, my last chapter in the book is titled Warmongers and Peacemakers. It's my deep hope that people can look at this and study it and look at alternative ways to stop war and stop aggression. One of the things that struck me along the way was how much aggression, how much violence there has been, not only over time, in the 20th century. I've asked other people to make estimates about the numbers of death. They don't even come close. Uh, there have been, as a result of either wars started by these leaders or disastrous social policies initiated by these leaders, over 200 million deaths in the 20th century. Uh, that, to me, is shocking and, and frightening, uh, and particularly as we develop even more powerful weapons of destruction. You say in your book that it was 1996, the first time in the 20th century, or maybe first time, in, obviously, in history, that there are more democratic countries in the world, or more people under democratic rule, than, than there are that aren't under democratic rule. That, that is correct. Um, this is it a good uh, sign? Uh, yes, I say it's a good sign. Uh, however, I do make the caution. I, I do, in the book, talk about different types of democracy. What certain people mean by democracy is not necessarily what you might mean or what I would mean uh, by democracy. Uh, I, I believe it is a good sign. It's a good sign for a number of reasons. What I found in my studies was that... Uh, dictators, as compared to democratic leaders, were far more likely to be involved in war than democratic leaders. I believe 74 percent of all dictators had been involved in some type of war, civil rebellion, something, during their term in office. That's compared to 37 percent of democratic leaders, twice as many still too much. 37% is an awful lot, but um, um, it's half of, of what you might find among dictators. So you were there at Lexington, Kentucky, at the University of Kentucky, a doctor, medical doctor with a expertise in psychiatry. Yes. Have you retired, by the way, from the school? Yes. How long ago? Uh, about a year and a half. But for 18 uh, years? Part-time. Uh, part I, I do go there occasionally. But for 18 yeah. years, you read 1,200, during that time, 1,200 biographies. Yes. Least. And you came up with the political greatness scale, yes. which is in the book. And I, uh, I may be wrong about this, but I, I found in looking through it that the number one, looking at all the numbers, the number one leader you found in the 20th century from your political greatness scale was Ataturk. Yes. Am I right about that? 
Yes. And after him, Mao, right after him, FDR. They're very close. Yes. I mean, on your point scale, Ataturk had 31, Mao 30, FDR 30, Stalin 29, Lenin 28, Ho Chi Minh 27, De Gaulle 27, Deng, 20, Deng Xiaoping 27, Tito 25, Suharto 25, I can go on. Yes. But um, why Ataturk? Well, let First, let, let me put those numbers in context. Uh, th those numbers are not engraved in stone. I, I would say that probably uh, that if you wanted to group people, uh, you'd take maybe a five to seven point swing and include them kind of all together. It just so happened that Ataturk did come out first. Why Ataturk? Uh, the political greatness scale, uh, I guess I, I need to say a word about that, if I may, first. Your invention. Yes, yes. Uh, I didn't want to invent it. When I first started the study, I was looking for some type of measure to evaluate political greatness. As I mentioned before, I, I was puzzled about this phenomenon. And I looked to others. I looked to political scientists. I looked, searched the literature. I could not find any actual scale that measured political greatness cross-culturally. Of course, people rated the American presidents or this kind of thing, but nothing cross-culturally. So then the question came to me, how do you go about evaluating political, what is political greatness? And then I had a kind of eureka uh, experience. Well, um, why not look at those people who were acknowledged by almost everyone as being great political leaders? Who are the famous names in history over time that come to mind when somebody says, mention a great political leader? People who come to mind are People like uh, Julius Caesar, uh, Augustus Caesar, Alexander the Great, uh, Bismarck. These are Ab your immortals. The immortals, the political immortals. Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, people along those lines. And I came up with 26 of those people. Okay, these, I, I think almost everybody would say these are the political immortals. And then I ask the question, what do these immortals have in common? Are there any common denominators? And lo and behold, I found a number of common denominators. Almost every single one of them had these characteristics. And, and I then used these characteristics, 11 of them, in developing the political greatness scale and tested the scale in terms of its reliability, in terms of its validity. It was interesting that the scale correlated extremely highly, extremely highly, with the amount of words allotted to these individuals in the Encyclopedia Britannica or the Encyclopedia Americana. So it had a validity to it. So this is the political greatness scale, 11 items on it. On what, what are some of the items? One item, unfortunately, several of them have to do with conquests, unfortunately. But this is how people evaluate political greatness. Military victories, more territory, uh, social engineering, changing the very nature of the society, uh, economic prosperity, Moral being a moral exemplar in a way, people like George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, for example. So it doesn't have anything to do with whether you feel warm and fuzzy about somebody. No, it has to do with accomplishments, it, political achievement. Is there any comparison with what you've done with political greatness scale to the Time Magazine Person of the Year, where people get outraged when they see Hitler on the, on the uh, cover and they think that they're naming him a great person? Yes, I, I think it's an excellent uh, kind of comparison. By greatness, I mean nothing about what, how you feel toward the, you know, do you admire this person? I mean, some of these people are despicable. They're horrible people. However, their achievements, political achievements, are monumental. 
Let uh, me just show, uh, we'll put this on the screen, uh, and I'll read down the pr American president so people can see how you fit on the scale. If 31 was the top at Ataturk, and FDR was the top of all American presidents, you then have Truman at 23 points, Theodore Roosevelt 23, Ronald Reagan 22, William McKinley 20, Dwight Eisenhower 18, LBJ 18, George Bush the first uh, 15, John F. Kennedy 15, Bill Clinton 15, Jimmy Carter 14, Calvin Coolidge 14, William Howard Taft 12, Gerald Ford 11, uh, Herbert Hoover 10, and Warren Harding 9. Those are presidents in the 20th century. I want, I want to ask you quickly, though, about one of them. Why yes. William McKinley so high? Why William McKinley? A lot of people don't realize that uh, William McKinley was quite an activist uh, president. He was... Uh, uh, he secured the uh, Philippines for the Americans. He liberate, helped liberate uh, Cuba. Uh, there were many things that he did that actually, on this political greatness scale, scored him, gave him higher points than some of the other kind of presidents. I might mention, too, that, it, that as you rank them, if you were to look at those rankings compared to... Uh, some of the rankings that have been given for presidents of the 20th century, you would find a very high correlation. It, it's surprising how close that is to what others have independently come up with on I don't know what kind of measures. But then on the other end of the scale, I mean, the one that got the least number of points is somebody, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it right, named Stein, who was with the Orange Free State starting in power in 1899. Yes. You know who that was? <laughs> Well, uh, he, he just simply accomplished not, heart, nothing. <laughs> That's he got right. a two, and Arias <laughs> yeah. of Panama yeah. got three, and yeah. Joseph yeah. Cook of yeah. Australia in 1941 yeah. got five. Samuel Doe of yeah. Liberia got, uh, in 1980, got five, and then you have somebody named Quisling, I believe. <laughs> yes. Five. Somoza, you got the Somoza uh, father and son. Yes. Juan Bosch, Kim Campbell, Canadian. Yes. above us there only got a six from 1993 sorry <laughs> no. Does it mean basically they did yeah. nothing happened on their watch it, it means not only did nothing happen it means that there was corruption they often ended their uh, time in disgrace um, could they be there for a short time like Kim Campbell was there a very short a time. very short while yes yes and, mm -hmm. uh, and and that's another criterion how long are they in office in terms of uh, as to whether or not they will achieve greatness, how, the, how they'll score on this political greatness scale. Go back to why Ataturk on top of all these people. Okay. Let's look at what Ataturk uh, did. And, and again, mind you, take this in the context of some of the other great leaders, that I, the, some of the immortals I've mentioned. Ataturk created, started Turkey. He dismantled the Ottoman Empire, which was in existence at the time. He not only was the founder of the country, creating a country, but he uh, caused a profound social change in Turkey. He uh, introduced democracy into Turkey, somewhat a militant type of democracy, but a democracy nonetheless. He separated, he was one of the first time in history to, to kind of separate church and state. In fact, even though it is predominantly a Muslim country, uh, it's one of the few ones where certain types of freedoms are permitted. And in fact, uh, the military is obliged to intervene if there's any threat to the democracy in any way. So at every single level, Ataturk uh, had an incredible effect, and his achievements were remarkable. You seem to enjoy writing about this man right here. We're going <laughs> to close up of him. King Farouk of Egypt. When was he king? Uh, oh, about 1950, up till about 1950, something like that. What do you see in this picture? He's 330 pounds, you say. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I introduce it. I, 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 do try to introduce uh, a bit of humor throughout the book uh, to uh, make the facts a lot more palatable. I said that uh, P 
people are supposed to grow in office, and certainly King Farouk did in every way. <laughs> and uh, um, you call him Little Farouki. I called him I, I, Little Farouki. He was a brat and pampered and uh, um, I might say here is a leader of the country and uh, he, he is supposed to uphold the faith in the country. From my information, he never really read the Koran. He uh, never read a newspaper through. He never read a book. Um, he almost had people go to school for him to digest the information beforehand. And I guess I introduced him for uh, the reason I, I, I am not overall too fond of the kings that I have encountered in the 20th century. And uh, Who served the longest uh, in, of all your leaders? And you, you feature yeah. him in the book. Yes. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, oh gosh, um, uh, Austria, Habsburg, uh, Franz Joseph. Franz Joseph, 68 years. Thank you. 68 years. How did he stay in power for 68 years? Uh, that, that is uh, an excellent question. Um, persistence. Uh, he was a, a very unimaginative person. Um, I do mention that he had a rather unique political and military strategy to when he went to war, and he went to war a number of times, um, he would uh, usually concede or uh, give up before his country lost, and then once he gave up, he would then try to start rebellions. It just, I mean, it, it, there are all kinds of weird things with him. You uh, break folks down into categories, the leaders of monarchs, tyrants, visionaries, authoritarians, transitionals, and Democrats. Uh, are those your categories? Yes. What would, have, uh, a, what would a tyrant have been? A tyrant was somebody who um, went into office and uh, uh, essentially uh, ruled the country for power and perks predominantly. Usually military rule, Oppression. Can you name one? Oh gosh, I can name a, a number. Uh, Duvalier in Haiti. Um, um, uh, uh, Papadoc Duvalier. Uh, um, I think we have one now in the Middle East in uh, Iraq. Saddam Hussein. Yes. What? A, what's a visionary? A visionary is someone who whose ostensible reason in office or in, in being a leader is to transform the country according to his vision. And I say his because they're all men here. Uh, and for example, Mao transformed an entire nation into this communist image and, and his own notion uh, of communism. Uh, Stalin did that. He was a visionary. What about a authoritarian? Authoritarian would be someone who is not necessarily uh, holding office for his own gains, but who believes in law and order, who believes in the country. Um, Juan Perón, for example, would have been an authoritarian leader. Uh, authoritarian leaders were some of the, uh, what I call the apparatchiks, the uh, bureaucratic leaders in the Soviet Union who came after Stalin and so forth, whose purpose was to maintain stability in the country, who were dedicated. Um, what would Khrushchev would have been? Uh, Khrushchev was close to, he, he, he had some visionary uh, notions as well, but he was he was pretty close combination visionary op uh, operatic. What's a transitional? A transitional is someone who ch 
changes the entire nature of the country or who brings a new country into existence. Um, for example, um, Dave Valera in Ireland helped create the state, the country of Ireland. Back in 1937, you Yes. Say. Eamon? Uh, Eamon. Dave Valera. Yes, yes. Um, um, I would say uh, Nelson Mandela would be considered a transitional. He helped change the nature of apartheid to a more democratic form of government and a new form of government. So a radical type of change either from or independence, Nehru would be a, tran a transitional in India. You, uh, there are all kinds of little sidebars in, in this as you know. Uh, one of them is the use of drugs on the part of leaders. Um, it, you say Patrice Lumumba, Prime Minister of Republic of Zaire, Zaire smoked hemp regularly. Nicholas II, the last Russian emperor, took cocaine for fatigue for months during his last year in power. Jean-Claude Duvalier, also known as Baby Doc, likely smoked cocaine since he attended many parties with his wife who allegedly su supplemented her government salary of a million dollars a month by trafficking in cocaine and assorted other drugs. How did you find all this stuff? <laughs> uh, with difficulty, but it was there. If you, it, it, uh, it required some investigative work. Uh, I also happen to have uh, worked with an excellent uh, person, Greg Gunther, who was my research uh, assistant then, and he was he was excellent at ferreting out a lot of this information. Uh, Leonid Brezhnev, according to Mikhail Gorbachev, stayed, quote, whacked out on tranquilizers and often seemed more dead than alive. Mr. Gorbachev write that in his memoir? Yeah, apparently, yes. Some question exists about whether the stimulants Hitler doc Hitler's doctors regularly prescribed for him and the cocaine solution he took for his sinus uh, pain increased his paranoia. Yes. Uh, Mr. Noriega snorted cocaine while he held power? Yes. Uh, were you surprised at how much of the, the drug use you found? Yes, I was. You were? I was. Why? Well, I, I, again, I, I came into this study. I, I, I did have a bit of awe toward political leaders, awe and scorn, probably a combination of uh, both. Uh, but uh, somehow, somehow I, I did not anticipate and expect this much mental, emotional uh, type of problems among them. The m amount of mania, the, the, the frank craziness of many of them, the paranoia was rampant. You say that 60% of the British prime ministers in the 20th century suffered from depression. Yes, yes. And th those are uh, Herbert Asquith, Stanley Baldwin, Arthur James Balfour, James Callahan, Neville Chamberlain, Winston Churchill, Edward Heath, Andrew Bonner, Law, David Lloyd, George Ramsey MacDonald, and Harold Macmillan, Robert uh, Arthur Salisbury all suffered from depression. That's correct. That's severe correct. very often? Yes, often, often severe. And, and uh, again, I was, I was astounded to find that, that there would be that many. And in fact, in the book, I, I almost... <laughs> wondered whether being depressed is one of the uh, criteria for becoming a, a British Prime Minister. Certainly, uh, Winston Churchill well, really set the tone. I mean, it, it, his depression, in many instances, was incapacitating. What about uh, Winston Churchill became very depressed back in 1915? Charles de Gaulle became very upset about a student worker protest near the end of his presidency. All this, you say, led to some depression. Yes. Uh, Indira Gandhi remained depressed for months after losing the election in 77. Muhammad Ayub Khan became increasingly demoralized in response to his deteriorating political situation. How were they treated when they became depressed? Did you find that? Most, um, almost all, uh, did not take advantage of psychiatric uh, help, certainly. Um, either they could not admit it or their advisors or whomever felt that that would not be uh, uh, politically advantageous for, for that to become uh, known. Um, Winston Churchill, his main uh, way of handling what he called the black dog that would come over him was painting. Uh, he used uh, that as a type of way of lifting his spirits. Uh, 
Others treated their uh, depression kind of by themselves. They drank, many. Um, some took, I think Macmillan it was, took amphetamines and, and became hooked on them. Um, Pictures of people like this. <laughs> call it a person. That's my favorite picture in the book. Uh, there are many others. I'm going to show some others as you talk about this. Why so many pictures of, of monkeys and gorillas? And okay. um, all of the behaviors were, most of the behaviors we're talking about, and most of that um, I, I do develop and describe what I call the primate model of ruling. And um, what I do is not only, um, um, I, I, I want to demonstrate that particular picture, for example, I wanted to demonstrate that uh, among gorillas, too, you see the sense of presence that you find in many rulers, the sense of charisma, in a way. You wonder, where does charisma develop from? Well, you can see this in a number of the primates. Uh, oh, that, that's, that's a wonderful one. I do want to point that out, that again, looking for parallels with uh, chimps and so forth, that uh, particular chimp is attacking an imaginary image. He's attacking the mirror image of himself in the mirror. So I also use that to illustrate that a number of rulers begin coming up and generating enemies from nowhere. Look for enemies. As, as this chimp apparently is doing. What about this one? Okay, uh, that's, that's a very young chimp in the San Diego Zoo, and he's beating his breasts. He's beating his breasts. I'm going to be big someday. I'm going to be strong. I'm going to be a leader. I'm going to dominate. And uh, he's getting in practice for the dominant struggle. What did you find about the youth of some of the tyrants or the authoritarians or, or uh, you know, some of the ones that uh, have killed a lot of people in this world. Yes, yes. Well, uh, let's start with the last uh, question you asked first, um, uh, Mr. Lamb. Uh, you asked, uh, and that is, uh, I, I, I was particularly in interested, I was particularly interested in knowing if I could find any common pattern in some of the mass murders of the 20th century, some of the, the people who have committed the most horrendous acts, people like Hitler, uh, Stalin, Pol Pot, uh, Mao Zedong, um, who was the fifth one? Um, there was another one. Uh, and so I looked in some depth at uh, their childhood and uh, although it, they, they were disturbed in different ways, and a, a lot of them had difficulties with their father in particular, and they got into trouble in some ways, I could not come up with any convincing findings that I could say this was the root of their later becoming uh, these monsters that they later became. I could not find it. And the conclusion I came to as a result of this, and with a number of the other leaders as well, is that something very important takes place, some transformation takes place as one gains ultimate power. That the very process of gaining ultimate power changes the nature of the person, changes the way they look at the world, changes the way they look at themselves, so forth. That, you know, the old saying that almost everybody knows is uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And, and I, I believe there's a lot of truth to that. So you found no real connection in their youth if they were tyrants uh, for what they became no. as leaders? No, no. Uh, a so number can... of them were cruel, a number were not necessarily. I mean, Idi Amin, for example, was... Uh, former head of Uganda. Former head of Uganda, was a, a British officer, and he was uh, 
uh, cons- sort of uh, thought of very highly. He uh, liked to put on performances. He amused people. He was a delight, seemingly delightful person. He got power. It changed dramatically. And there are many other instances that with increasing power, changes begin taking place in, in the, the way they relate to themselves and others. You, you say that you, you scorn a lot of politicians. Yes. I mean, tell us about your own feelings about politicians and where did that come from? Well, certainly um, uh, the whole process of, uh, in, in, a, in a number of um, countries where to gain ultimate power, uh, all kinds of, um, let's say, le- less than forthright or honest behavior takes place, where promises are made that aren't kept, where people, you know, there's an expectation for a certain amount of lying or manipulation of the public takes place, where... Is that any particular, I mean, like you get that in a democratic society? Yes, oh, absolutely. You get it in every society, absolutely. No matter what kind of leader you are, whether you're a monarch or whether you're a Democrat? Yes. Small d Democrat. Now, Small d. Yeah. Do you vote in our system? I sure do. What would, how would you describe your own politics? I, I like to think uh, independent, and uh, I don't want to commit myself because I want a lot of people to buy the books. <laughs> <laughs> so you, well, uh, let, me, let me read uh, uh, what you wrote about uh, Richard Nixon. You, you, you selected him for a little more copy in the book than others. Why? Um, I believe I, uh, uh, under the section under the chapter in which I talk about the childhood, childhoods of the various rulers, I, I pick one example to illustrate each type of leader, one for a monarch, one for a tyrant, and I picked Richard Nixon to illustrate a uh, democratic, established democratic leader. You say, I selected Richard Nixon, former president of the United States, as our model democratic leader because he was forced to act at odds with his basic character which should have made him one of the least suited people to rise to political prominence in a democracy to achieve his political goals. Explain yes. why you feel that way. <laughs> um, uh, many of the people, uh, the, in terms of the uh, childhood characteristics of a number of the democratic leaders, um, I found were outgoing, uh, were uh, charming, were uh, often athletic, uh, popular. Um, they, um, they, they had a more effusive type of personality. From what I was able to gather about uh, Nixon as a, a child, he was, uh, uh, he was not well liked. He was persnickety. Um, he did not like to get too close to people, didn't want to touch them. Um, and yet, uh, with all of these characteristics, unusual characteristics for the Democratic leaders, where you need a popular vote, he was remarkable in the sense that he, through persistence and uh, thoughtfulness, cunning, whatever you want to call it, was able, growing up, to get in progressively into one leadership position after another. He, whatever organization he was in, he moved to the head of it through diligence, hard work, application, and so forth. And amazingly, even even uh, become, prior to becoming president, it, uh, I think a lot of people were surprised that uh, he ran, and even more so that he won. Another man you write a lot about is Mao, and there's one section that I don't even think I could read here about the way, maybe you can explain it, the way people dealt with Mao in his late years, and it even went so far as his bowel movements. Yes. And, and, and where did you, I mean, this, well, was that stuff come from his doctor? Uh, there, yes, I have, uh, I have a lot of information from his doctor. I have information from uh, others who have researched this in great detail. This is not firsthand on, on my part, but I put together uh, this information. Uh, 
And uh, there, I, I, I like to think I describe some delightful anecdotes, interesting anecdotes uh, there about, about a number of these leaders. But in his case, he was so revered that, and there was a period of time that he was very constipated, and he would have uh, workers, have, have his devoted following, um, if he could not have a bowel movement, they would dig out the, const the constipated uh, feces. And there were times that when he d was able to do it on his own, that people rejoiced that, that he, he has had a bowel movement. They were actually so, so rejoiceful about it. Uh, it did get on that he, it, that changed over time. Um, <laughs> he, uh, the, the, I, I think he was helped where somebody de developed or devised the kind of stool that he could sit on in a way that would facilitate things. But, but beyond that, his relationship with women, uh, the, his own body hygiene, all that, I mean, it, yes. it, it, it doesn't read very well. <laughs> it's, I mean, what's that all about? No, oh, no, but, but, uh, what, well, I mean, how, how revere, why, how can you revere somebody like this when you, uh, the way you describe the way he was like personally? Oh, okay. Uh, the way you revere him and what I describe when you say it doesn't read well is that I don't mean it was written for I th I mean, well thank you I, th I think it was written written say written, written well. brilliantly yes. ah yeah. wonderful no thank I you. mean yeah. just it, yeah. it's it's not it's yeah. not particularly uh, he, uh, he played up he pl I, I think this is what you're getting at he played up the peasant image the uh, uh, and he exploited it uh, he, there was a kind of uh, he had a kind of perverse sense of humor too for example there was a instance of a reporter, a female reporter, interviewing him. And while she was doing it, he was reaching in his clothes and down, picking off lice off of his body. And, uh, uh, and that, that was, <laughs> it created a kind of revulsion toward him. And yet, he seemed to delight in doing this, in, in keeping people off balance, in a way. But I think much of what you're describing has to do with playing up the peasant image, which was very important for him. Even though he played it up, what a lot of people didn't realize is that he took full advantage of his prerogatives. He would have swimming parties with nude women, all kind of young women, swimming around, gambling around in the water. And uh, he had one of the finest collections of uh, erotic literature in the world. Um, so, uh, he, 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 he had all of the prerogatives of ultimate power, but he liked to play up this peasant image and upset people. Did you find any successful, uh, world leaders, in your opinion, who were monogamous, who led a, you know, behind the scenes, a moral life, who... You know what I'm getting at. We're honest, <laughs> all that. I mean, and who would you put on top yeah. of that list? Oh, my goodness. Let's see. Well, yeah, yeah the answer is uh, yes. Uh, th there certainly were a number of uh, um, moral exemplars, uh, people who uh, I, I, I think were very uh, admirable. Uh, I, I, what come to, I, I, offhand, I can't list... A number of them, but what one would come to mind would be, uh, uh, I, I would think that uh, I couldn't find very much in Jimmy Carter's past that would be negative. I think that, uh, uh, I think he, he was honest, he struggled with his uh, feelings, but he did not, uh, uh, I think he tried to do a good job. What about uh, Harry Truman? Ha Harry Truman, yes, Harry Truman I think would be uh, a good example. It's pretty well. high on your personal yes. political greatness list. Yes. How about Theodore Roosevelt? Uh, I would say thank you, Theodore Roosevelt as well. How about Ronald Reagan? Uh, Ronald Reagan as well. So, well, then you've got, I mean, what about, go back to the political greatness list, Stalin, Lenin, Ho, De Gaulle, Deng, Tito, Suharto, Nehru, any of those? Mussolini? No. No. Hitler, Borgiba, Gorbachev, Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson's pretty high on this list. 
That's correct. And why would that be? Go back to, again, the reason why FDR, Woodrow Wilson, Harry Truman, Theodore Roosevelt, there are highest presidents on your list of pol political greatness scale. Yes. Um, all of them have um, been social engineers, have changed the nature of society by introducing various types of legislation that changed the way uh, we function in society, that have changed the nature of civil rights, for example. All of them have been victorious in war, which again is uh, an important consideration. It's interesting that uh, um, no American president, hardly any president at all, or any leader at all, has achieved political greatness without being involved in some type of military engagement. You start out in your book at one point talking about alpha males. And yes. we heard a lot about alpha males during the last presidential election. How does that relate to this? <clears throat> what I claim is that, that, and making sense out of all this uh, behavior, is that, that uh, there is a tendency, a biological and social drive for a, particularly in men to achieve dominance within a political uh, structure in a society. Um, eventually those who do get to the top become king of the mountain, who eventually do get to the top, uh, off, usually are alpha males. Alpha males in the sense that they show a lot of the characteristics of alpha male chimps, gorillas, baboons, and so forth. What are those characteristics? Um, I found in my studies, in my book, that the more power these leaders have, the more likely they are to have extramarital affairs or harems, the more likely they are to uh, have larger broods, more children. This is the same thing alpha males among other primates have. The more likely they are to have special access to food and shelter, but this, by that I mean more likely to build up fortunes and have be taken care of for the rest of their life. And the other important thing is alpha males expect submission, expect people to treat them with deference. And that's part of becoming an alpha male and the drive to become an alpha male. And all of these leaders also do that. In fact, the more power one has, the more likely one is to form a personality cult to ensure that people defer and even worship them. 27, go back to the beginning, 27 of 1941 leaders you studied in the 20th century were women. You say half of them got there because they were the daughter of or the wife of. That leaves people like Margaret Thatcher. Yes. Now, how did Margaret Thatcher become for 11 years the Prime Minister of Great Britain? <laughs> and how, why was she so strong? Yes. You, uh, you could, Margaret Thatcher, Golda Meir uh, are, are a couple of uh, examples. Um, I believe uh, they're remarkable uh, people that they were able to do that, but it's kind of interesting. I also point out in my book that all of these, most of these women are referred to in masculine terms. They're, you know, for example, uh, uh, well, I, I, I can't, can't use, I'm, I'm concerned about using the word on television. They've got what men have, uh, and uh, uh, they know how to kick butt. Uh, they're, they're described with masculine types of traits. It's also interesting that even though they've gained power, that their, their cabinets are most all men, that the leaders of the military are all men, that uh, uh, at every level below when, with, when women are there, they're not women who start getting, filling in these slots. They have, their, all their advisors still are men. But again, um, uh, you're right, these are remarkable women. Where did you get the uh, title of this book? 
it dawned on me that uh, that's what it's all about. King of the Mountain, the striving for dominance, the striving to be on top. How many copies did the University of Kentucky Press print on your book? Oh my goodness, not very many, uh, I fear. Uh, uh, I think they started out with 4,000. And what does it sell for? It doesn't have a price on my book. Um, something like $30, but I think some of the discount places are down about $22, $24, something like that. It's 475 pages, 18 years of research. How do you feel about it now that you look back on this job? Whew. Uh, I feel very good about it. I, 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 I really hope that it does catch on, not for personal interests. I mean, I don't need the money, I don't need the finances, uh, so forth, but, I, but I'm concerned about the implications. Uh, warmongers, peacemakers, uh, I, I hope people will read the book and use some of these insights in terms of stopping some of the violence uh, in being able to create a more effective peace. Last question, and I hate to even ask it, but I've got it after 1900 and what is it, 41 leaders. Of all the ones you studied, which one was the favorite to read about and write about? Ooh, my goodness. Uh, I like Teddy Roosevelt. I thought he was interesting. And, uh, uh, and I did like Ataturk, I thought was fascinating. Yes. Here is the cover of the book. Again, King of the Mountain is the title of the book. Arnold Ludwig, Professor Emeritus from the University of Kentucky, our guest. We thank you very much. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs>